It's a joy to be here. Uh, you have heard a lot has been going on in my life. I have a baby girl in the house, and you know what that means to a father. I've been telling people that uh, I am a proud man walking because I have um, a baby girl in the house. I am still married to one wife who is a woman. It's important because of uh, some people who are trying to do things uh, the other way. Praise the Lord. I want to thank the chaplain for giving me this opportunity uh, to bring God's word to us this afternoon. And I was asked to talk about the joy in believing. The joy in believing coming out of uh, that passage that has been read by our sister. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14. Philippians 3, verse 1 to 14. But I'll focus so much on the passage as opposed to the topic in uh, my sharing. Let us pray as we look into God's word. Blessed Lord, it pleases you to speak to us this afternoon, and you have chosen me. Lord, I pray that uh, you will be glorified even as I stand before your people. I pray that you speak to me and speak through me and speak to my brothers and sisters to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, friends, this passage, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14, Paul, the apostle, the great apostle, is expressing the joy in putting his faith in Jesus Christ. He is proud. He is rejoicing because he knows the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior, because he encountered him and he is walking with him. And so he is expressing that joy coming out of his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not forget that it is the Apostle Paul writing, the great apostle, and he's writing to the church at, um, at Philippi. Now, the church at Philippi um, was, the, was the first church that was established in, in Europe. And um, Paul established this church and is writing to them from, from prison. This is one of Paul's prison letters. He is writing from prison in Rome and is expressing the joy. He is glad that he knows the Lord even when he is in prison. Now, you may be asking, preacher man, where is Philippi today? Philippi today is Greece, and um, Greece is, is found in, in, in Europe. Now, friends, don't also forget that uh, this is the Paul who was persecuting the church. This is the man that had been moving from place to place, dragging believers into prison. And of course, as you may remember, on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, as is written by Dr. Luke in Acts chapter 9, he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see a change in the narrative. What a contrast. A man that has been persecuting the church is now rejoicing because he knows the Lord as his Savior. Praise the Lord so much. Amen. Amen. When the Lord Jesus comes into your life, you do not remain the same as we will see. Paul is now rejoicing. He is preaching the gospel and is writing this letter to encourage the church at Philippi, to encourage them. Perhaps they were saddened to learn that the apostle Paul was in prison. So he writes to check on them, to encourage them in their faith, but also to thank them for the support that they had sent him uh, through Epaphroditus when he was in prison. Now, brothers and sisters, what an amazing passage we have before us this afternoon. Paul begins by reminding them, by, by telling them that rejoice. 
And he says, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and is safe for you. Paul has been writing. In fact, the word joy or the, the word rejoice appears about 16 times in this very short book. He has been encouraging. In chapter 1, he tells them, you know, he talks about the joy in preaching the gospel. In chapter 2, he talks about the joy in serving. Chapter 3, the joy in believing. Chapter 4, the joy in giving, the joy in supporting the gospel. So he's saying, it is no trouble for me to write the same things. Now, from verses 2 to 6, he turns to those people he refers to as the mutilators. These perhaps were Judaizers whose teaching was misleading. And they were telling the non-Jews, the Gentiles in this case, telling them that they had to be circumcised. They had to observe the Jewish law in order for them to be put right with God. And you know, he recounts his own background and he tells them, when you, you turn to verse 5, he says that if there is anyone to, to boast in such, it is me circumcised on the eighth day, you know, of, of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. And, 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 and Paul is not boasting, but he's reminding them that I have personally been there. We should boast in the Lord as opposed to boasting in religion, in our credentials. Now he goes on and he expresses the desire he has to, to know the Lord more. From verse 7, he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss. Now, Paul is longing even to know the Lord more from the prison, from that Roman prison. He's longing. He's saying he has lost all things. He had it all. But he's longing to know the Lord more and more. And if you look at um, verse 9, he says, And be found in him not having a righteousness from, from the law, but that which comes from faith through Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him. Look at verse 10. He is longing to know the Lord more. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That I may share in his suffering. He is already sharing in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. And when you read from, from verse 12 to verse 14... The Apostle Paul says that he is pressing on toward the goal. He is still pressing on, even at his level as an apostle. He is still pressing on toward that goal. And what is the goal? The goal is to know Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord so much. Amen. The Apostle Paul has not graduated. He is still longing to know the Lord, to grow in him. Now, we do not have much time, brothers and sisters. I want to draw your attention to five lessons that come through uh, these wonderful verses. Number one, the Lord is calling us, or the Apostle Paul is calling us to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Praise the Lord. He says in verse one, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Let me say, friends, this afternoon, that true joy comes from the Lord. True joy comes from the Lord. I've already said that joy is the main subject of this book. And you may be asking, what is joy? Joy is that feeling of inner gladness, a deep-seated pleasure. And independent, listen, independent of what happens. In other words, it does not depend on the happenings around you. It is that deep-seated pleasure. It is a depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart. 
It is a cheerful heart that leads to cheerful behavior. Joy is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, but it is God's gift to believers. Praise the Lord so much. One scholar has said that uh, joy is not the absence of challenges, but joy is the presence of God in your challenges. Praise the Lord so much. So I want to encourage you, friends, this afternoon as you come before the Lord. The Lord is saying, rejoice in him. Let me say that joy is part of God's very essence. And his spirit manifests this supernatural joy in his children. Joy is the deep down sense of well-being that abides in a believer's heart. And that believer knows that all is well, even in the face of challenges. Praise the Lord so much. And as we come this afternoon, you know the Baganda have been talking about the economy. And our friends, the Banyankore will say, hey, been to be gumire. I want to encourage you to rejoice in the Lord. Based on that relationship that you have with him, the challenges are there, but the Lord is with you. And so rejoice. Rejoice. I will not forget it was the year 2017 when our first born, I think Chaplain said I'm sick away, so it is right for me to share a few things about my family. It was 2017, um, must have been 1st of October, because the boy was born on 2nd October. And, and, and I went to hospital, first time father, and... Um, I knew that uh, my wife was going to push the baby. So in the middle of the night there, they tell me they bring some papers for me to sign to take her to theater. So they operated her, you know, some 30 minutes into uh, the new day. And in the morning, um, she had a convulsion. Some of you may remember this story. That was the first time I, I, I saw someone convulsing, and, and I had to find someone to explain to me what that, you know, meant. It was terrible. I didn't know what to do. So I, I, I went to, the, to, to my car, sat there, and started crying to the Lord. Now, now I said, if, if the Lord does not help me, who is going to help me? And yet, I was not weak in my faith. Neither had I lost it. Now, some wrong teachers will tell you today that when you have challenges in life, your faith is not strong enough or you are not praying enough. That is a cheap gospel. I want to encourage you, friends, that you may have challenges. I do not know what you are going through right now. But rejoice in the Lord, having that confidence that God is with me. You have not paid tuition. And you are saying, preacher man, what are you talking about? Yes, I have been there. Rejoice in the Lord. And this time, guess what? Because God took me through the first scenario, which was very tough for us. Seeing your wife, you know, collapse. This time, again, it was an operation. But I was very confident. Because the doctor had been encouraging us that your wife is going to push this baby. And again, when we went to hospital, she said, unfortunately, Reverend, we have to go to theater. And uh, I was very confident that God would do it. And yes, he did it. He did it. Yes. And he can also do it for you. Number two. Put your confidence in Christ, not in the flesh. Put your confidence in Christ, not in the flesh. Verses 2 to 6, the Bible says, look out for the dogs. The apostle Paul calls them dogs because they are deceiving God's people. 
They are basing their religion, they are basing, you know, on, on, on wax. Look out for those dogs, for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason to, for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Praise the Lord. Let us not put confidence in our background, in what we are studying, in what we have achieved in the past. Our confidence should be in Jesus Christ. Paul is warning, is, is warning us about placing confidence in, in achievements. In achievements. Now, at, at a glance, one may think that Paul is boasting about his achievements. But in actuality, he is showing that human achievements, no matter how impressive, cannot earn someone's salvation and joy. Let me say that Paul had impressive credentials, as we have read. His upbringing, his nationality, his family background, he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. Now, don't forget that the first king of Israel came from this tribe. King Saul. Some scholars have actually suggested that Paul was named after this King Saul. You remember that before he converted, his name was Saul. So he was a Benjamin, a powerful man, as if that is not enough. A Pharisee. Remember the Pharisees, separated ones. They had their own rules, their own laws. You know, on top of Moses' law, they didn't want to mix with anyone. However, his conversion, brothers and sisters, was not based on these credentials. It was based on grace alone and faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. These credentials could not give him joy until he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this afternoon, or disappoint you, achieving great success, it could be in your studies, in your career, some of you are starving. Students cannot give you salvation. Neither can it guarantee joy. That you will have that joy that comes from that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I know that majority of you are doing law. And this is not an attack on you. But remember that the Apostle Paul was an educated man. He was a lawyer. Sometimes these things stand in our way. Every time a preacher comes before you, you are trying to look out for what did they study? What is their level of education? And because of that, you, you, you stay you know, you, you, in, in, that, in captivity, in prison. You may be a professor, learned man, but that can never give you joy. Praise the Lord so much. It can never give you joy. It doesn't matter the family you come from. I met a young lady the other day at Kampala campus, and I was inviting her for prayers, and this young lady told me, excuse me, Reverend, I am okay. <laughs> well, you, yes, you can interpret it in your own way. Sometimes we think we come from very powerful families, and therefore we think we are self-sufficient. We have it all. What are you talking about? I am doing the best course in the country. So I don't need the Lord. <laughs> I don't need to come to church. I want to disappoint you, brothers and sisters, that true joy comes from the Lord. That will not give you joy. Listen, the Apostle Paul, 
a lawyer, a Pharisee, a man that has been persecuting the church. He's top up there, but he's saying, I want to know the Lord. I want to participate in his suffering. Praise the Lord so much. Amen. Number three, desire to know Christ more. Desire to know Christ more. And this will come from verses seven and nine. Verse seven and nine, the apostle Paul says from verse seven that, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Other versions say garbage in order that I may gain Christ. Praise the Lord. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Of course, you remember Paul's testimony. A learned man. But he says, I want to know Jesus Christ. And according to Paul, everything is lost. Everything that he has been is lost. Why? Because he wants to know Jesus Christ. Let me say that your achievements should never get in your way of knowing Jesus Christ. You're going to become powerful people in this country. Some of you are going to become judges. You're going to become powerful lawyers in town. You're going to become influential in your families, wherever God will send you. Listen, that should never get into your way of knowing Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord so much. Ah, that when the preacher comes here and he says, let us pray, you don't even want to close your eyes. Eh? Our relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than anything else. It is more important than your family. Excuse me, it is more important than your profession. Christ is calling us to desire to know him more. Desire to know Christ more. However, friends, to know Christ more may require you to make major changes in your life. For example, changing your values. What you treasure, your priorities, Knowing Christ may mean changing your plans, changing your goals and desires in order to conform to what you learn about Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Remember that Jesus Christ was God. When you go back to the previous chapter two, he was God and he leaves his glory in heaven and he comes to die a perfect God dying for people who are imperfect. And you see, after that, the Bible tells us that God exalts him. So we need to learn from him. And in verse 9, we see that nothing can put us right with God. Righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness and joy comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Righteousness and joy comes from knowing Jesus Christ. It will never come from jurisprudence. It will never. It comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Number four, and this will be the second last. Desire to become like Christ. Verses 10 to 11, Paul says that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Praise the Lord so much. Amen. Friends, what, has, what does it mean to become like Christ? I'm saying we need to desire to become like Christ. 
from these verses, we see that it calls to live you know, a transformed life, to live, L-I-V-E, to live a transformed life. Number two, to participate in the suffering of Christ. That is part of the Christian you know, journey, portion. Becoming like him in his death. Now, this could mean two things could mean dying to sin, dying to our old way of living. And he says, and sharing in his resurrection, resurrection, living a new life in him. Praise the Lord so much. Dying to sin and living a new life. You know, the apostle Paul is in prison. He may die any time. But he's looking forward, he has suffered, and he's looking forward, you know, to die, but also share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that death here could mean physical death, or de you know, death to, to sin, and resurrection, living that life in Jesus Christ after we die. But also it could mean a new life in Jesus Christ. And friends, let me say that to become like Jesus Christ, we must die to sin. We must live a new life. We must be willing to share in his suffering. We must be willing. Sometimes it, it, may, it may call us even to die, physical death. And let me say that just as Christ was exalted after his resurrection, we too will one day share in Christ is glory. If we keep in him. Paul understands this. Paul knew that he could die anytime. But he had his faith, unwavering faith in Jesus Christ that he would be raised to life again. Lastly, press on toward the goal. Press on toward the goal. Verses 12 to 14, Paul is longing, you know, to, 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 to know Christ more, to, to press that goal. He says in verse 12 to 14 that, not that I have already obtained this or I am already perfect, but I press on to make, I press on to make it because Christ Jesus has made his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. The goal here, friends, is to know Christ, to become like Jesus Christ. This goal took all Paul's energies, took all his credentials. Praise the Lord so much. And I'm not saying that you seize, that you throw away your qualifications. No, this is not what I'm saying. I am simply saying that Christ should be number one. Praise the Lord. It should be our, our first goal to know Jesus Christ, to press on toward that goal of knowing Jesus Christ. We should never take our eyes off the goal of knowing Jesus Christ. God is calling you this afternoon to forsake anything that may distract you from knowing him. For this reason, actually, the Apostle Paul encourages, tells young Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, he tells him to suffer like a good soldier of Christ. He tells him to be disciplined like an athlete. He tells him to be patient like a farmer. Nothing should distract us. And he tells him not to be involved in civilian affairs. Sometimes as Christians, we miss the mark when we get involved in things that are below our standard. Remember that you are a child of God. Jesus bought you at a price. He died for you. Therefore, you must live in a way that honors him. Do away with those things, the civilian affairs. Suffer, be willing to suffer like a good soldier. Be disciplined like an athlete, and be patient like a farmer. So how do you press on toward the goal? You may be asking. Friends, we need to 
constantly, consistently, we need to read God's word. We need to keep in prayer, communicate with our God to strengthen our relationship with him. We need to be involved in a discipleship class. I'm glad we have discipleship classes here. I think every Sunday after church, be involved in a fellowship so where you can be supported to grow more in Jesus Christ, where you can have accountability partners. Finally, witness to God's people. Preach the gospel like what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's preaching the gospel in season and out of season, preaching the gospel in word and deed. As I bring this to a close, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord and put your confidence in him, not in your achievements, not in your qualifications. Desire to know Christ more. Desire to be like him. Press on toward the goal of knowing Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to apply these lessons in your lives. Beloved, the joy in believing is not dependent on momentary happiness, but is rooted in the eternal joy found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When we shift our confidence from the worldly standards to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, we discover a joy that endures endures all, that endures trials. We discover a joy that triumphs. So may you press on toward the goal of deepening your relationship with Jesus Christ, finding joy in believing and sharing this joy with the world around you. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you continue to minister to each heart before you this afternoon. You know us and you know the things that have troubled us. May you minister joy to your children. May you help us, including me, to put our eyes, to fix our eyes on you, not in our professions and in what you have given us. Help us to desire to know you every day that will never graduate, Lord, from learning, from being your disciples. Lord, may we desire to cultivate a character that reflects that we are your children indeed. Help us to press on, Lord, to that goal of knowing you, but also ultimately of sharing in that gift that you have prepared for your children, the gift of uh, eternal life. This is, Lord, my prayer for myself and for these, my brothers and sisters, through Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. Amen. Amen.